the other acts that are mentioned, the primary one, singular act of the apostles is talking about Jesus, sharing about Jesus, making sure that the good news is heard by people, making sure that new people hear the good news, that friends and family hear the good news, that neighbors and acquaintances hear it, that people where you work, that people where you shop hear the good news. Everything you see about these people throughout this entire book you're going to see that where there's supernatural, where there's amazing things happening, whether there's persecution that's breaking out, in the midst of every last bit of it, they're sharing the good news. They're talking about Jesus. It is the primary act of the apostles. And I believe that it is the primary act, should be, that the Spirit of God is inspiring every last one of us to do. He's inspiring us to talk about Jesus. Last week we talked about how the power of the Holy Spirit came for a primary purpose. And that primary purpose was to empower every last one of us who are believers to be witnesses. This week, I want us to focus on what the initial effects of the Holy Spirit coming into the life of of the church looked like. We know that there was a primary purpose for which the Spirit came, but there are also a lot of secondary effects that the Spirit coming did in the lives of these men and women that we're going to read about in Acts chapter number 2. When the Spirit came, it was a new thing. Nobody had ever done it this way before. Nobody had ever seen this before, but the Spirit of God came in a powerful, fresh way, and One of the things you'll see initially, Peter got filled with the Spirit and just ran out and started preaching to strangers. And 3,000 people got saved. You cannot get away from the fact that the Spirit of God came in power primarily, first and foremost, to empower us and inspire us to talk about Jesus. But there are all kinds of Uh, 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 secondary, auxiliary things that the Spirit of God did in the lives of these people. And I want us to see the experience, but I also want us to look a little more intently at the effect of that experience later on in this chapter. So let's just walk through some verses this morning. We're going to be in Acts chapter number 2. And I think I'm just going to begin reading there in verse 1 and kind of walk through a little bit of the story, the Spirit of God coming in power on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter number 2, beginning in verse 1, Luke writes, when the day of Pentecost arrived. Now, Pentecost is, uh, of course, it's, that's the festival, the Jewish festival of weeks. It's... it's um, uh, Shavuot, I believe, is, the, is the, the, the Jewish term for this. It's the festival of weeks. It is intended to celebrate the arrival of the wheat harvest, but also celebrate the giving of the law. And so, as a consequence, in Jerusalem at that time, after Passover and waiting for this uh, time, there are all kinds of people in Jerusalem. It's bustling at this time of year. And the apostles and the, all the followers of Christ had gathered together in an upper room, and they'd been waiting there for 10 days. In the midst of that 10 days, the day of Pentecost fully arrived. It says they were all together and in one place. And suddenly, that's a word that's pregnant with the idea of surprise. Okay? They did not, hear me, hear me, hear me. They did not schedule a revival. This did not happen on their timetable. They've been locked in a room together praying for 10 days. I mean, you know how it's like sometimes. You pray for 10 minutes and you feel like God is just as worn out as you are. 10 days together just trying to do life and praying and worshiping. And the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place and suddenly... There was nothing about this moment that they did differently 
that caused this to happen. It was a suddenly moment. It was wrapped up in God's timing. God appointed a day and he called it today. He appointed a time and he called it now. And that's why it's happened when it's happening right here. It happened suddenly. If you think you can do something that will get God on your timetable, welcome to your lesson in patience. They didn't do a thing that got God on their timetable. God showed up in a sovereign moment when he was ready, that he had appointed. And suddenly, verse 2, there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Now, I want you to recognize that what happened in verse 2 was a physical thing that happened that they actually heard with their physical ears. There was a sound of a rushing wind that filled that house. The, 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 they, they didn't hear it with spiritual ears. I believe they heard it with physical ears. And I'll tell you why I believe that here in a minute. But it was a physical manifestation. Now, I know there are people, and maybe some of you here today, that are totally freaked out when we start talking about God showing up and you actually hearing something or seeing something. Well, you got to let God bust out of your box today. because Well, he ain't ever been in that box anyhow, but we try and put God in this little box. We try and conform God to what we want his image to be, and God is going to show up, and he's going to be nice and gentle. He's going to be exactly who I want him to be, and then in moments like this, the power of God shows up, and we'll bust out of that box. They heard with their physical ears. It wasn't mass delusion. They heard with their physical ears. Verse 3, And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one. The way the Greek actually reads, and it's hard to get it, the descriptive nature of it to come out in English, but it's like fire appeared and then split and divided and then landed on each one of them. They saw it with their physical eyes. Now, it doesn't say anything that they felt fire, they felt heat off of it, but they saw something. You liken to the burning bush where the, the bush burned, but it wasn't consumed. This fire of God showed up and then just dispersed and landed on each one of them. It's, called a, it's described as a tongue of fire. It just basically means a little lick of fire, one little flame that landed on each one of them, and it sat there. Okay, I'm going to be honest. This is weird. I want you to know that if while we have church today, I see fire on your head, I'm probably going to try and put it out. I mean, really, there was no history for this. This was was not the norm for them. This was peculiar, yes. Don't put God in your little box. The way that he shows up and manifests when his power is present is as unique in situations as the people and the groups that he comes in power on. Now, I don't think that we should be seeking the sound and the flame as the norm. I don't think there's anything in the Scripture that supports that. There's no sign that this particular, what happened here, happened again. But when God showed up in power in this moment, it was more than something that they just felt. It was something that they heard and they saw. It overwhelmed their senses. I think concerning physical manifestations such as this, I don't think we need to be seeking out physical manifestations. I don't don't think we need to start a movement of the fireheads or, or, you know, play sound effects of wind rushing through just to try and stir something up. I, I don't think we need to be seeking out those manifestations. But at the same time, don't think they're so aberrant that if they did happen, you would be like, oh, no. No, 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 not me. 
there was a season in my life where there were a few things about spirit-filled living that I just said, God, I don't want to do that. You know, I'd like to have some of these other things about your power being loosed in my life, yes, but I don't want to do that. I'm going to give you a good word from Job. He said, that thing which I have feared the most has come upon me. And if you have any of those, God, I want, but I don't want. Um, God's not going to live there for you. He's going to do whatever it takes. He's going to do what he wants to do. It's going to look like he wants it to look. And you're going to be happy with it. Nobody was fussing that this was strange. They were overwhelmed with the goodness of God in this moment. And so I don't think we need to be seeking after physical manifestations, but I also don't think that we need to write them off. Verse 4 says, and they were all filled. That is the word for filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. If you're here today and you've got a prejudice against the gift of tongues, let me, let me clue you into something, okay? Every single book in the New Testament was written by somebody who spoke in tongues because they were all in this room. I'm like Paul. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and he said, you know, I speak in tongues more than you all and I wish you all spoke in tongues. That's me. You say, well, I've never heard you do that because I know how to do things in order. But this is one of those things that I said, God, I'd really, I don't, I'm not interested in that. And that thing which I feared the most. And I'm grateful. I love it. Uh, every day, this morning during worship, the, this morning on my drive to work, to, 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 to work, listen to me, to church. <laughs> well, I only work one hour a week after all, right? It's a part of my life. I love that it's a part of my life. And I'm not the least bit ashamed of that. I'm not, uh, I, I don't make it the big deal, but it was a part of their life. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was in this room and spoke in tongues. All of the apostles were in this room and spoke in tongues. And they didn't, they didn't do it for show necessarily, but it overwhelmed them. And in the following verses, I, I want to I point something out that it just never occurred to me. There's nothing in this passage that says when that little lick of fire went away. <laughs> now, I've made an assumption that it just kind of showed up and then was gone. But that is an assumption that's not supported by the text. The fact is, we don't know when it went away. We assume that it did. But when they step out into the commotion that's being because their their commotion is drawing a crowd and when they step out into that they could in addition to be speaking in these languages that they've never learned before <laughs> their head could have been on fire so well i don't want to be a part of that church here's the deal if that was your opinion back then, and there were plenty of people in the crowd that, that was their opinion, that meant you could not be a part of any church. So you need to be careful where your prejudices lie. So, so these amazing, overwhelming experiences happened. And then in verse 5, you have the story of the crowd seeing it. I think it's interesting to me that when the Spirit of God fell and it started getting attention from outside the walls, they didn't close the doors. They didn't say, oh no, we don't want to quench the Spirit. We're going to close the doors and stay in here you know, and insulate ourselves from the big bad world and have us, you know, a Holy Ghost explosion. 
if you saw the apostle. Going to have a Holy Ghost explosion up in here. That's not what they did. The Spirit of God came on them and drove them out into the streets. Verse 5, now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered. That means confused. Because each one was hearing them, that is the 120, speak in his own language. See, in this instance, the gift that they were given was actually the ability to speak in a language they had never learned. Those of you who have struggled to learn languages know how difficult it can be. Aren't you a little jealous of them who just like went to church one day and it happened? There's nothing that says that they had this ability to speak this language for the rest of their life, though. All we know is they had this ability in this moment. And they, verse 7, that is the crowd, were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? So we know these people. They're local folk. How do they know our languages? How do they know our various dialects from all over the known world? How is this possible? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language. That means that there was a group of people who were inquisitive, who were being drawn to the goodness of God in this moment, and every last person in that crowd was hearing the gospel in the language that they needed it to be in. It's an amazing, miraculous moment. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phygeria, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya beyond the Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jew and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. That's basically Luke saying, everybody. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And they were all amazed and perplexed, listen, saying to one another, what does this mean? When the power of God shows up, what you want when you're being empowered to witness is for people to be inquisitive about what does this mean. That's the goal. There were people here who were inquisitive because the Spirit of God that just filled that 120 with power was also working on 3,000 so that their ears would be ready to hear and their hearts would be receptive to truth. When you share the gospel, you're getting into a divine a dance where God's working on you to share the gospel, but at the same time, God's out there working on somebody else, preparing them to hear and receive the gospel. When you all get together, power happens. When someone sees the power of God when they hear the gospel, you want them to ask, what does this mean? I believe that that was an earnest and honest and sincere question. And I believe it was evidence that the same spirit that filled them in that upper room was also working on the crowd. God empowers both the speaking of the gospel and the hearing of the gospel. But not everyone had such an inquisitive response. There was another group in the crowd. Look at verse 13. But, that means that what you're about to read stands in sharp contrast to what you just read. But, others mocking said they're filled with new wine. They're drunk. Paul's response, or Peter's response was, no, it's too early in the morning for that. But I mean, honestly, if you're a drunk, is there too early in the morning? I always thought that was a weak response, but... Think on it. These people in that crowd 
one and all, we're witnessing the uncut power of God manifesting on the people of God. They were witnessing the same kind of power that raised Jesus from the dead, filling common people, not the religious elite, but common folk. They were hearing the power. They were seeing the power. They actually, in this moment, were witnessing the curse that was placed on humanity at the Tower of Babel. You remember Tower of Babel? Uh, Back in Genesis, they're building this tower to get to God, and they're doing it in defiance of God, and they're doing it because they they want to prove that they can get up to where God is. And God looked at them and said, these people are united. And they can, I mean, they can't build a tower to heaven, but it's like they can can defy me in their unity, and I'm not going to have it. And so he went down and he scattered their languages there at Babel. And even to this day, more than the color of our skin, it's our languages that separate us on the earth. And so when when this moment happened, what they were witnessing was a divine supernatural reversal of that curse that happened at the Tower of Babel. And now it's being reversed so that anybody can speak to anybody and tell them good news. They're witnessing this, yet through their eyes that were not being enlightened by the Spirit of God, they judged it as drunkenness. I pray you can hear me when I say this because you're going to get disappointed if you don't. Those who don't have their eyes opened by God will never fully understand what is happening to you or why you're the way you are when you're following Jesus. If their eyes are not opened by the same Spirit of God that opened your eyes, they'll not understand why you're the way you are. They'll not understand why you act the way you do. They'll never understand why you are so serious about certain moral issues. They'll never understand why you use your money to support a local church and to support others in your community. They're not going to understand why you value certain things that you value while you're here on a Sunday morning rather than being at the lake. They're not going to understand. I grew up, this was my kind of word, they're going to look at you like a calf looking at a new gate. They've never seen it before. I don't understand what it is. Now, you're going to be tempted to get frustrated with them. But hear me. Blessed are your eyes. That's that's why they see. And the only reason you're not in the same boat with them is because God in his mercy opened your eyes. And so rather than getting mad at them, you need to worship God that you can see. But in their misunderstanding, in their lack of ability to understand, they're going to try and explain what's going on in your life in the best way that they know how. The best way to explain this in the natural was they're drunk and acting a fool. Look at them. They lit their heads on fire. They're drunk. They'll judge you and they'll say, oh, they're just high on that opiate of the masses. Comfort for the weak-minded and soft-headed. They're experiencing group and mass delusion because of emotionalism. These people are simply taking their religion too far. Hear it all the time. Hear me. You can get mad about it all you want, but the fact is they can't see what they can't see, and you cannot make them see by being angry with them. Just get at peace with the fact that when God is doing something powerful in your life, there are going to be two groups of people in the crowd. 
There's going to be one group that says, what does this mean? In all earnestness, honestness, since honesty, sincerity, they're going to say, what does this mean? Because God's at work in their lives so that they can see and hear the goodness of the gospel. But there's going to be another group there as well that's like, why you got to bring this church stuff to work? I mean, honestly, we'll go to church on Sunday, right? It's like, do we have to go every, why do you have to go every week? Doesn't that mess every weekend you have up? You mean you go on more than just Sunday? In the middle of the week, you're going to go hang out with other people just because they're Christians and you're going to talk about the Bible? What? Hello, Thursday night football. What? You're going to go do, I don't understand you at all. You gave how much to the local church? That's a car payment. No wonder you're driving an older car. Listen, they're not going to get it. Do you get it? It's not because you're awesome. It's because he is. If your eyes see, it's because the Spirit of God has done something to them. I want to take just a few minutes before we go this morning and talk about the effect that this had on people. Peter went, rushed out, and he preached, and 3,000 people got saved. Um, that's awesome, unless you're the pastor. <laughs> Honestly, it's a logistical nightmare. I want church growth. We got probably north of 120 adults in here this morning, probably. I know we got more than that souls in this building. But if we went from 120 to 3,000, oh my goodness. We're going to have to get all four nurseries up and running. You know, I'm going to have to have support staff all over the place. Oh, my goodness. How in the world do you take 3,000 people and start working them toward a place of maturity when all you got is 120? I'll show you how. The first key happens in verse 42. It's describing their community, and it says, they devoted themselves. It happens by every individual who's a part of that local body making the, uh, or being aware that the Spirit of God is at work in them, and they devote themselves, where it doesn't take anybody you know, shaming, cajoling, inspiring, threatening, but instead, individually, personally, devoting themselves. I believe the they that's described there in verse 40, 42 is the entire 3,120. Individually devoting themselves. The presence of God that fell on their lives on the day of Pentecost did this to them. It inspired personal devotion. I think verse 42 by itself is probably a description of the discipleship process of the 3,000. I think that, that the 120 who possibly had walked with Jesus for as much as three years now were tasked with discipling 3,000 who maybe had just heard the name of Jesus in that moment. And, and they needed to bring them to a place of maturity. So how were they discipled? There are four things that are mentioned in verse 32. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. 
Now, the apostles' teaching is not, hear me, you, you, can, you can easily overlook this. The apostles' teaching is not the apostles personally teaching things. That's not what that is. The apostles' teaching is the sum total of everything the apostles learned while they were with Jesus. And it could be taught by anybody else. It wasn't just the apostles doing the teaching. It was the teaching that the apostles learned while they were with Jesus. And so that means anybody in this 120 filled with the Spirit of God was capable of doing that. Don't ever think that somebody who's sitting next to you in a chair isn't just as qualified under certain subjects, certain settings, to speak truth to you and let you know what the truth of the Word is. They're, many times, they're more qualified than I am. Just because I have a mic doesn't mean that I'm more qualified to speak on every subject. But the truth is, I can't personally be involved in everybody's life to that degree. But you're surrounded by enough people that can. And, and I know there are people, I, I get it. You say, you know, everybody makes the excuses. You know, well, I just don't like reading. I don't like to study. I don't like this. You know, it's all too confusing. And this, we sang the song this morning that was filled with theology, and it fires me up. I love it. And you say, but that's because you're weird. But know that the apostles' teaching was the first thing mentioned that they had to commit themselves to. So I wonder, do you know the simple things of the faith? We live in a time when there's just hardly any excuse. If you have a smartphone device, you know, you can do things other than, you know, surf for porn on it. Or shop. Or tweet. Or Facebook stalk people. You have access to the greatest preachers who are alive on the planet right now, almost in real time. In addition to that, you have access to all the great preachers who have already died, but were thoughtful enough to write their stuff down. And most of it is free. In fact, if somebody charges you, write them off. There's somebody better. Let me say that again. If somebody charges you, write them off because there's somebody out there who's better. It's available. And, and when the Spirit of God came on these people, it birthed in them a desire to teach and be taught. How much we know. It's more than just it was placed in your life for more than just to make you a better Christian. It was invested in you so you could invest it in others. That's how 3,000 are discipled by 120, because they couldn't be discipled by 12. So they committed to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship. It's a word about close relation. Let me sum it up. They, they were part of each other's lives in intimate ways. They shared life together. They broke bread. It's an, it's an element of that. I'm rushing at this point because I know I've taken time. They ate together. There's fellowship. We do that now. Let's have supper. Let's do lunch because relationship builds around meals. And so we come together, we eat. And notice, it doesn't say they were doing Bible study. It says they got together. You get together and live life on life. You want to really grow up in the faith then find somebody you want to be like and find ways to get next to them. They ate together and they prayed. And here I want to say, they committed to prayer. That's corporate praying. That's not individual praying. That's about them praying with one another. Like I've said before many, many times, most of the prayer in the New Testament is corporate praying. It's a group of people praying together. If you want to really learn how to pray, pray and you don't feel like you know how, get around somebody that does know how, and it'll rub off. 
They got together, they prayed. That was their discipleship program. Everybody intentionally, personally taking responsibility to devote themselves to learn what they needed to learn, teach what they needed to teach, be around one another, eat and pray together. Hear me. Church. Where's the organ? What's their bulletin like? What's the children's program? Let me just say, all of it. This is not specifics. This is broad, overarching things. But hear me. Church, would you as a believer want to be a part of that? Okay, dangerous place because, you know, people die in church. We're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks. You don't want to mess up. But you want to be a part of that? Look at, one of the, look at one of the other things, just one more thing. All came on, verse 43, many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. It's incredible. Verse 44, all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions, belonging, and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. They took care of each other. Now, I have recently heard some people use that verse to say it's a description of socialism. And let me be clear, it's not. Okay, socialism is about a government that's forcing people to redistribute their stuff the way that they see fit. That's not what's going on here. This is not socialism. This isn't a government program. This is the Holy Spirit reaching down and working in a devoted Christian and inspiring them to use their resources for more than just their own consumption. And I want to say this very clearly. I'm not trying to be political. The government's never going to be able to get that right. And I'd a lot rather your money be in your spirit-filled hands to meet the needs of those you know. But here's the deal. Do you know needs around you? Uh, do, do you know people well enough to know when something changes in their life and they have a need? Are you trying to be a part of people's lives when you don't have a need? Somebody's ears just perked up and it's like, yeah, talk about that because I need something and I'm going to go tell people after church. Do you want to be a part of their life when you don't have needs? Because you want to invest in them. Church. There are people all over our country today, all over the CSRA, that are on the lake and they have had the I want to say unmitigated gall, but maybe the ignorant delusion, maybe just who knows. But they've said, yeah, the lake is my church. I just go out there and get alone with God. Where does the scripture ever say that church is getting alone with God? Nowhere. I'll clue you in. Don't look for it. It ain't there. You know... Spending time with my family on a Sunday, that's my church. Okay, where is that? You know, I just like to get out in nature, and that's where I experience God. That's my church. Just taking this word church and just like, just define it however you want to apparently, right? Right? I'm not the only one that's heard people do this, right? Hear me. The gathering, the ecclesia, the community of faith, what we call the church, is a certain thing, and it does certain things. And they're all inspired by the presence and the power of the Spirit of God in every devoted one. We share the gospel. That's what the Spirit's there inspiring us to do, to share the gospel. We learn and we teach each other. We make effort to be a part of each other's lives. We eat together. We pray together. We're involved enough that we know one another's needs so that we can meet those needs as we have the ability and we're, as we're directed by the Spirit. 
We do life together. Church. Church is not something you come to on Sunday morning. It's something you are a part of. It's part of who you are. I don't know that there's any greater decision that you're going to make apart from choosing spouse and choosing friends as there is to what church you're going to be a part of. I think it's more important than where you work. I'm not saying quit, okay? But, but, but please hear me. I, I think that the community of faith that you're a part of is more important than so many other things that we put incredible value on, but I don't know have any eternal reward. This is an important thing. And the Spirit of God, when he fell, filled those people. Incredible manifestations. Some people understood, some people didn't. But the effect of that experience was to drive those people into community. It drove them into community. One of the things that we're going to see is they loved their community so much that they actually stopped going out. And God had to send, you know, a persecution into Jerusalem to scatter them so that they would go and do the work because they loved the community so much. But I'm not going to fault them for that because I always tend to take the good things of God and make idols out of them. Are you drawn? Do you have a hunger for the apostles' teaching? Are you drawn to be around other believers? Is there something in you that wants to know what's going on in the people's lives so you can invest there, knowing that in times of need they'll invest in you? If it's in you, hear me. If you really want that, if you have a passion to share the gospel, it's there because the Spirit of God is in your life and power. And if it's not there, I can't stir it up in you this morning by shaming you for it not being present. The only hope I have for you is the power of God manifesting on your life. So if you're aware, you know, he talked about some of those things and I don't really want them. Yeah, I don't, want, I don't want any of that stuff, actually. I don't want the sound. I don't want the flame. I don't want the tongues. He's preaching too long this morning. I don't want any more of this teaching. You know, I'm looking forward to getting out of here, being around people I actually want to be around. And you know. I don't know what it says about you. I'm not going to judge it. But I can tell you that the Spirit of God inspires us to want these things. And so if you recognize that there's a deficit in your life for desiring this stuff, what you need to do is just ask the power of God to come. Because if you're ever going to love them and want them as you need them, and you do need all this stuff, by the way, too. It's not just about whether or not you want it. You need it. But if you're going to want it, um, the only hope that I can give you is that Jesus died so that you might be in reconciled relationship with the Father. And one of the great benefits of that is he sends the Holy Spirit to live in you. And so the hope that I can give you is that Jesus died for you to love this stuff. Let's bow our heads together. Lord, I pray that if anybody's passion is waxed cold for community, if anybody's passion is waxed cold for sharing the gospel, Lord, I, I want there to be conviction, yes, but I also know that any time you convict us about these things, you at the same time give us the opportunity to repent and the power of God is released to change our hearts and push us and draw us to yourself. And so I ask that the power of God would fall on my brothers and sisters this morning that we would all be filled with the Holy Spirit. And in that filling, you would make us into who you want us to be. Whatever the manifestations are, whatever the long-term effects are, Lord, I want you and more of it. And I pray that you would pour yourself out on us fresh and new today 
tomorrow and all the days that follow. Glorify yourself, Lord. May it be so in Jesus' name. Let's all stand together. I want to.